This exhibit is about John Steinbeck in the 1930s and 40s and the fact that what he was writing endangered his life. There were threats, he felt there were threats. Um, we have one story of an actual incident which is mentioned in the Steinbeck Review. I did a piece on that. But what's really important is that there's documentation for some of this, at least documentation that he felt threatened and needed to be armed. One of the first things is this document is 1942, and it's New York State, and in 1942, in the fall, he applies for a, an application to, to carry two pistols. And he gets permission to carry two Colt automatics. It is for self-protection. Character witnesses include Burgess Meredith, Henry Barnum Poor. Henry Barnum Poor was an artist. This is a painting by Henry Barnum Poor, a wonderful artist. The family story is that in 1942, Steinbeck got a call in New York saying, you may think you're safe 3,000 miles away, but we're coming for you, which makes us think the call was somewhere on the West Coast. Since we know, or at least have been told that in 1937 or 38, sometime in the late 1930s, he had a gun pointed at him with the threat of death, he did not hesitate. He immediately got permission to carry these guns. I think he already had the guns. One of the interesting things on the application, it says here, have you had a pistol license before? He answers yes, and what date? 1938. 1938 puts him in Pacific Grove in Los Gatos. So we can assume he was armed here then. And if he had had a life threat in the thir late 30s, then, then he probably got the gun for that reason. Uh, the main reason in the 30s would have been that he was working on Grapes of Wrath. And there were a lot of people that did not want that book published. And, and he was born that way. Then, not that long ago, a woman walked into the gallery and she had this document. I don't know if you can see it, but she had several documents. These are letters to her father, George DeVolis, who in the 1940s was a Monterey cop. He was a traffic cop and a patrol cop. And it is from John Steinbeck in New York. Um, he talks about his family, about George's family, about probably finishing The Pearl as a film in Mexico. And then he goes on to say that he needs a gun for self-protection. And this letter is, is, is quite fascinating. It's important. He then asked George to send all his guns from the Monterey Peninsula back to New York. And we don't know how many. He calls it a caboodle. He says, will you pack up the whole caboodle? And that's usually seven and a half, isn't it? We don't know. It's something like that. Anyway, it is sent. And not only is it sent, we have the documentation. Let me show you this. This is a shipping invoice, and it's called Railway Express Agency, which was probably the UPS or FedEx at the time. And the, the shipment is insured for $300. It weighs 23 pounds, and it is to John Steinbeck, 175 E78th Street. And according to George DeVolz's daughter, that was probably guns, so revolvers. And at 23 pounds, Revolvers weigh a pound to two pounds each. That's, that's a, a lot of guns. Now, there could have been other things in it. It could have just been one gun or two guns. But this immediately follows this, the letter asking if he would please do that. So really interesting documentation. This is probably too small for you, but this is an image of George DeVolis, who died in 2004. Uh, he was important to this area. After being a policeman, he, he got into real estate, but he also was important as a community activist. He founded the Monterey Boys Club, which became the Monterey Boys and Girls Club. He also uh, founded a, a chapter of the uh, Boy Scouts in Salinas. So just, just a really interesting guy. Uh, in 1948, Steinbeck wrote to George again. And he may have wrote to him back and forth. We don't know. But these are the two letters extant. And it's May 24. 7th in 1948, and he says, Dear George, I was glad to see you the other day, although I could wish that the occasion could have been happier. Uh, two weeks earlier, Ed Ricketts died. And so we're pretty sure that we know Steinbeck came back for the funeral, and he probably ran into George again, and they started talking. And again, the letter goes into guns, the need for guns. I'll send you one. Can you send me this? So in 1948, he's still, still kind of thinking about this, you know, which I, which I think is really interesting. George, by the way, was considered probably the nicest person in the world. Uh, people loved him. I still talk to, to people that just say he was great. His daughter, Darlinda Ball, says, you know, 
dad and John really got along, but I don't think dad ever ran, read one of John's books. You know, so it was, and Steinbeck probably liked that, you know, that it was somebody he could meet kind of on equal ground. Those are, are kind of the ma major documentation, but this is sort of interesting. In 1939, he writes to Carlton Sheffield, they can't shoot me now because it would be too obvious and because I've placed certain information in the hands of J. Edgar Hoover in case I take a nosedive. Now, I think this is very interesting because everybody was calling him a communist at the time. He obviously knew J. Edgar Hoover. And in that first application I showed you, he's listed as working for the U.S. government. They weren't hiring a lot of communists. So it's how we get this, this, this misinformation. Um, he continues this letter. Uh, so I think I'm personally safe enough except for automobile accidents, etc., and rape and stuff like that. So I'm a little careful not to go anywhere alone, nor do anything without witnesses. Seems silly, but I've been carefully instructed by people who know the ropes. This is June 1939. So three years later, when he gets that phone call, if he got that phone call, which we think he did, you can see why he would immediately get permission to carry guns. He had a family at that time, you know, he had a, a baby on the way and he was married, so I think that would have been important. Carolyn Klein did this painting right here. And Steinbeck wrote once about how he'd like to be back in the Monterey Peninsula with his cat. So she did that kind of fantasy of a big, luxurious cat and Steinbeck caressing it. I think it's charming. Mm -hmm. uh, Gene Elmore did this piece of the Highway 1 on Big Sur, and Steinbeck worked there early. And uh, that, he was about 20, 21 years old when he worked on that highway. And we feel that fills that in. Belle did this piece, and she did it black and white as kind of a cinema noir piece. Uh, she felt like, because it is a dark story, black and white is kind of important. And it's the story of Andy, chapter four, I think, of, uh, of uh, Cannery Row, where Andy goes up at the goading of other kids and makes fun of an old Chinese man. And the old Chinese man turns around and looks at him, and Andy looks into his eyes and feels incredibly guilty and stupid for doing that. And it's, it's a pretty brave piece, 1944 or 45. Most people weren't talking about things like that. And one of the things that comes through in Steinbeck and all of this is a lot of courage because he just keeps on keeping on. I mean, he, he writes what he wants to write. Uh, this is by Walt Lee, and it's 1948, and it's Salinas Valley. Very unusual to get Salinas Valley paintings of that period. A lot of Monterey and Pacific Grove and Carmel, but, but not Salinas Valley. This is Patricia Cunningham around 1940-45 with the wharf. Uh, Luther de Joyner, this is again Monterey Bay around 1930-35. We, we wanted pieces like this because they tie in with that early period of Steinbeck and Canary Row and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is the illustration by Peggy Worthington Best for a deluxe edition of Tartilla Flat. That's the original illustration. And she's kind of a wonderful artist who's disappeared. We don't know what happened to her. Her husband was a poet and an editor for Viking Press. And that's how she met Steinbeck, and it's just unfortunate. Uh, Warren, Warren Chang, who does wonderful pieces of the field workers, this is a study for a, a large painting that he's done, and it's inspired by Malay, but set in Salinas. So you can do all those things, which are kind of interesting. Uh, this piece by Judith Dean was done one night she heard an argument on Canary Row, and she went out and, and saw people arguing and uh, went back in and did this kind of expressive painting real quickly which is why the broad gestures and everything else. This is thought, uh, there was a newspaper story that people thought this was Steinbeck. We don't know that. That's, that was just a mistake. Great story anyway. Probably m I misled them. Uh, <laughs> accidentally, accidentally, accidentally. Um, this is supposed to be Ed Ricketts though, and um, Judith did say that she, she recalled it. I mean, when she looked at the painting again, she was 91, so, there, so things happened during that period. Steinbeck wrote about Ricketts at this time that he was in love with a woman who felt he had a weak chin, so he grew a goatee, and Steinbeck said that accomplished nothing. It made him <laughs> look like half a goat and half like Jesus Christ, so he, he thought that was kind of a failure. This is James Fitzgerald's portrait of Steinbeck that's at the Smithsonian. And Fitzgerald did that while he was in Monterey. He was here for about a 15-year period. Uh, shared a studio with Bruce Harris. Well, shortly after we decided to do the story, this, or this exhibit, this painting came in. It's a very rare image of the Salinas Valley by James Fitzgerald around 1937-38. So there's a good chance Steinbeck was standing over his shoulder when he painted this. That almost seems synchronistic to us, that we're getting these paintings coming in like that. Um, 
This very interesting piece. This is the cover of East of Eden. And it's, um, it's by Roger Castle. And Warren Chang told me all this since he was in New York doing illustrations. Uh, Castle also did the illustrations for Jaws and Star Wars that you saw in movie posters. And this definitely looks like Julie Harris, who was in the film, but that does not look like James Dean. So Castle was doing the, the cow he wanted to do. Uh, it's an important piece. You can see it. I'm not sure if you picked up, but yeah, you can see it as the book cover. This, by the way, is in the first edition of County Row. If you find something in that, that wrapper, it's, it's, it's worth picking up. Uh, it's, it's really nice. Uh, here's another painting that's, that's very interesting. This is Steinbeck with books, all of his major books. And it's by Pam Carroll. And it's in the book, G is for Golden. And we wanted to show how illustrations are done. So here's the cover of the book. It's a children's book, great children's book. And there's the painting. But when Pam finished it, this is the way she finished it, loose. And you see dimensions mentioned there. And so when it comes out in the book, it looks all neat. Uh, the question when you frame something like that is, we like it that way, the kind of nuts and bolts, you know, that you see what's going on. Uh, this painting was found shortly before we decided to do the exhibit in a local thrift store. And some people swear at Steinbeck, and some people say, you've got to be kidding. So we have people vote. This is Steinbeck, <laughs> maybe, or you've got to be kidding. Right now, it's about 19 Steinbeck, 7 maybe, and about 22, you've got to be kidding. So it, um, is it dated, signed? It's, it's, we cannot read the signature. Anyone that can gets a reward or an award. It says Rome, 1944, and there are two biographies. One had, he was a war correspondent for a New York paper in Northern Africa and Italy at that time. But one has him leaving Rome in late 1939. The other has him being in Rome through the first few months of 1944. So it, it did come from Rome. It did end up in Pacific Grove. One person we know that traveled from Rome to, to Pacific Grove was John Steinbeck. Uh, the hairline works, the eyes, the ears, the nose doesn't. Might have been a street artist though, or something like that. So it'll be forever a mystery. Now here are two portraits you can compare around the same time. This is by Judith Dean. And that's, um, that's, that's a, a painting that was done at the same time. Her husband at the time, Elwood Graham, did this piece. And this piece is now at San Jose State, the original painting. This is just a print, of course. This painting has been missing for a long time. Uh, one story is the film director, John Houston, won it from Elwood in a poker game, or it traveled here or there, and we don't know. Some people think it's in Ireland, some people think it's back here. So anyway, if you come across it, jump on it. <laughs> it's a very important psychological portrait. A uh, couple other images I think are interesting. This is by Bruce Harris, who was a good friend of Steinbeck's, and that's Monterey, 1936, Lower Alvarado Street. Bruce said one of the reasons he used a San Francisco newspaper is that in those days, uh, Santa Barbara or Monterey or, or paper like that wouldn't carry headlines like that, but a big city newspaper would. So it makes sense. It's kind of a um, heavy, dark thing. Uh, one story is the boy became a very successful businessman. And you can see if it's out there hustling newspapers, you know, in that kind of environment. 